Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the International Day of Light, a celebration of science and art of light and how it impacts our lives everywhere, every day. Uh, I'm honored to be your MC today. My name is Zach Yenser. Uh, I'm the host of a local talk radio show uh, on AM 1030 The Voice here in Tucson in Southern Arizona. Uh, I'm also a Yun family guy, uh, and I'm the executive director of Tucson Yun Professionals, uh, which is Arizona's largest network of Yun professionals here in the state of Arizona. Uh, Arizona is known uh, worldwide uh, as Optics Valley. Uh, our state is home to world-class businesses and institutions with decades of leadership and innovation in optics, photonics, and astronomy. We are here today to share our collective passion for the science of light with everyone. And, and I mentioned a little bit about my bio just to, to kick us off here, uh, only because I'm so excited to be here today. I'm so excited to be celebrating uh, Optics Valley with all of you uh, today. Uh, I, I think that communities are most successful when they know what they're good at and they story tell that well. Uh, and that really drives who I talk to, what I talk about on the show, uh, and other parts of, uh, of my life. Uh, Tucson Young Professionals looks for uh, how we create opportunity in our community. We create opportunity by knowing what we do well and telling that story. Uh, and so I'm so excited today to be able to part of telling this story together uh, and with you over the next uh, few hours. And as maybe you can hear, uh, my little one will be joining as well. I have a young daughter of four years of age uh, and she's certainly going to hang out with us for the next uh, for the next hour. Uh, before we get going, uh, and I do want to get going quickly because uh, our kids are waiting for this first part, uh, I want to recognize our presenting sponsors. Uh, our Fl Flandros Science Center uh, and Planetarium, uh, Optics Valley, which is a part of the Arizona Technology Council, uh, SPIE, the International Society for Optics uh, and Photonics, uh, and our gold sponsors as well, uh, the University of Arizona Bio 5 Institute, uh, Edmund Optics, Leonardo, uh, PI, Physic Instrumente, uh, Viavi is another gold sponsor I want to recognize. Really appreciate uh, these folks and these organizations uh, for their support of this International Day of Light, helping us recognize what we do well and telling our story. Uh, I want to turn it over to uh, our moderator for this first session and get going sooner than later. Uh, we'll be back together throughout the day and I'm excited to, to guide this journey for the next few hours here. Uh, but I wanna turn it over to Noelle Hensley, uh, the Education and Outreach, uh, or with Education and Outreach with the Flandrau Science Center and Planetarium. Noelle, the floor is yours and everybody, welcome aboard. Thanks Zach for being our moderator today for the International Day of Light. Can everybody hear me? All right. So like Zach said, I oversee the education and outreach programs here at Flandro. Before we jump in um, to our presentations, we would like to just remind people that there is the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen where you can drop your questions in. But there also may be times throughout the presentation um, when the presenters want to engage with the audience. So as long as you raise your hand and let me know, I can then um, call on you and unmute you so then you can engage directly with the presenters. Um, so we have two awesome collaborating uh, partners today. We have SARSF and we have the University of Arizona Physics Club, both with interactive activities. I did put those in the chat. Um, there are materials to go along with those. If people wanna grab them, they were sent in the confirmation emails as well. So they're very minimal um, uh, supplies that you can find around the house. Um, so now I want to um, introduce our first presenter, um, presenters from SARSF, which is a STEM education nonprofit dedicated to bringing critical thinking and problem solving to every child in Arizona, which is a very lofty endeavor. And we super support everything that SARSF does. So. Thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it. So um, we are, they are going to be looking um, at noticing and wonder with um, uh, the chief program officer, Brooke Meyer, as well as SARSF's manager of STEM curriculum and instruction, Sherry Dennis. So 
Sherry and Brooke, thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to hand it over to you. Awesome. We are, everybody's like excited to be here, but it truly is. When we get those chances to work with, with students and families, um, it just brings a new excitement. And to be able to do that on a Sunday uh, is definitely exciting, especially as warm as it is outside, right? We're inside and able to do some, some science um, and have some fun with our, with our children um, while we are in the coolness of our house. One of the things that the pandemic taught us was that you don't need a lot of stuff to do science, that we just by taking the time to notice and wonder the world around us, we're able to um, get to develop and encourage the curiosity um, of, that our children come to us with naturally and science and engineering can come from that base rather than having to go to Amazon or some other store and purchase and buy a bunch of things. So our plan for this past year has been to use things that students could find in the homes. We've been in about 50 plus classrooms this year um, and we did all of that with materials that could be found at home. So we're excited to share with you today what those materials are, what they're going to be and just a very basic basic, simple activity that you can grow on and continue to use with your children at home. With that said, I'm going to turn this over to Sherry Dennis, who is our manager of STEM and uh, STEM curriculum and instruction. And I'll be jumping in with her every chance I get because I love doing science education. Oh, thank you so much, Brooke. And Zach, I couldn't have said it better of uh, uh, the storytelling. We at SARS have love a great STEM storytelling books and we oftentimes with our younger students we share stem books that are excellent and in learning um, can everybody see my presentation i'm not sure if we can we can okay all right so um as uh we talked about we will be sharing a great book but before that you need some materials. And if you haven't gotten them yet, you need like four to eight pieces of plain paper. We'll show you what you can do with those. A pencil or a marker, a flashlight. If you don't have a flashlight, like the cool one that I have, you can use your cell phone flashlight and then an adult as your science assistant. All right, so let's get into it. STEM picture book that we're going to focus on today is called Sun, One in a Billion. And the author is Stacy McNulty. I love this book because the pictures are great, but the information is wonderful in this story. Once upon a time, about 4.6 billion years ago, a magnificent and important star was born. And that mag magnificent and important star was me, your son, with a capital S. Ancient earthlings saw, thought I circled the earth. Can you imagine me revolving around the earth? And some might think that I sit in the sky all day and all night. But I got moves, baby. I'm spinning. I'm not only important, I'm generous and good looking. Sun rises, sun sets, northern lights, southern lights. Are you ready now? Sit back and enjoy the show. Brooke, would you like to introduce our special guests? I would love to, to introduce to you some special guests. Um, Danny Wright works for us at SARCEP as well. She's our director of events and volunteers, but more importantly, she brought a, along with her Simon, Right, who is Sarsef's Notice and Wonder Specialist. You know what, he's a student just like so many of you are. And he's gonna, he's y'all look at those hugs and love. <laughs> he is going to be with us, helping us see exactly what we're doing and how easy and is to do at home so that you can enjoy the sun that Miss Sherry was talking about and also be a scientist. So let's move forward. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute and um, I would, I think what I'll do is probably pin Danny so that it's more important for you to see Danny and Simon noticing and wondering. Um, let's see here. Simon, it's so good to see you this afternoon and you're all ready to go. I love your big smile. I can't wait to share what you're gonna share with the rest of the boys and girls out there. We have, you have everything ready? We had tons of markers and a pair of scissors. 
Oh, fantastic, Simon. It looks like you're ready to go. So Simon has his papers kind of spread out on the table. Your assistant. Yes, your science assistant. I'm so glad you brought Miss Danny along. I'm so glad you brought your mom along. You're going to, Simon, you're going to need your pen in a second. But mom, as a scientist, she's going to take the flashlight. Yep. And hold it up. Simon, can you put your hand out on the paper? We're going to mimic what the sun's movement is. So Simon, you ready? Lift your hand up kind of like this. Are you ready? Look at me. Here's the paper. Yep, just like that, but more on the paper. And notice that his assistant is preparing the paper so that there's a desktop that has lots of white paper that you can draw on and that you can also see what we're doing. So make sure you lay that white paper out on the tabletop um, adult assistant while your student scientist is getting ready. So Simon, um, what do you notice about, um, about the sun throughout the day? What do you notice, Simon? that you can just print your hand and you can just trace your hand with extra fingers. <gasps> what do you mean you can trace your hand with extra fingers? I noticed my shadow. Yes. And the top part looks like a sun. Oh, will you trace around that? Or have mom trace around? Trace around it. You put your hand back up and I'll trace around it. Okay. Yeah, you, there we go. Let's trace and Miss Sherry, are the boys and girls at home, are they doing that with us or yeah. are they watching first? Well, they can, they can go ahead and try it out as well too. Wow, look at your fingers. Those long fingers. It's a shadow. It is a shadow. That's what you notice. Hey, wow. All right. And then what that would be like in the morning, right, Simon? Simon, would that be like in the morning? Well, look where the sun is located or the, the sun. Let's pretend this is the sun. Light sun. Yeah. Okay. It's way down close to the earth, huh? Wait, wait. I can make this real. Okay, I need this. <laughs> So that conversation that Simon and his mom ha are having right now is so crucial to helping Simon notice and see what's happening in the world around him. And moms or dads or adult scientist assistants, um, you're able to help guide that discussion. Good. And you still have five fingers there, right, Simon? Five. Fingers you have there. Do you still have five? Fingers? Five. Simon, I wonder if the um, sun moves throughout the day, what would happen? Do you, where do you think that sun flashlight would be around like lunchtime? What do where you should think? I put the sun flashlight? If it's lunchtime, where? Oh. Oh, oh can you, you got put, it, Simon. Yeah, uh -huh. can you put your hand back in the same position? And let's and back where it went. Okay. to your shadow mm -hmm. then. Oh. Okay, now we'll trace your shadow. Here, can you hold the sun up? I'm going to trace your shadow now. You hold the sun. Hold the sun still. Okay, and I'll trace. You see, we definitely need to have an adult assistant oh. to be able to do this activity. Simon, what do you notice? Oh. It's different. <gasps> oh. And I have three fingers. And you only have three fingers on that one? Okay, so Simon, uh, what do you want? One was five. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, goodness. One, two, three. Oh, my goodness. So what do you think? I know how that works. I don't know how that works. Are you ready? Let's put that paper back down the same way and put your hand there. And now, so that was morning that we did, right? And then we did lunchtime. We did lunchtime. In Where bed. should it go for night? Noon. Oh, you're right. Afternoon. Afternoon. Okay, are you gonna hold it or am I gonna hold it? You hold it and I'll trace. Okay, so this is afternoon. Mm 
it's hard to do without blocking. <laughs> <laughs> what are you noticing, Simon? One, two, three, four, five. Five. Wait. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Okay, the first one five, was five, and the next one was three, and the next one was five. What? And what do you notice about the position where it is on the paper? It's everywhere. Everywhere <laughs> on the paper? <gasps> Look at that. What does it make you wonder about the sun in the sky? Wait. Okay, this looks like a love. It looks like what? A glove. A this, glove. this hand here looks like a glove. Right. That is so wonderful. If you notice and wonder, do you have any other wonders? Like, what could you do besides the shadows inside with your hand? What else could you do? I could color gray in them. You could color gray in them? What else could you do? You could cut them out. Oh, you could Ooh. cut them out. You could make different shapes. Ooh, Simon, what if you went outside and you didn't have your flashlight? What do you, what could you do to see your shape? You could look at the sun. Oh, do you think it might look the same as your hand if you traced around your shadow of your whole body with the sun? I mean, you could do the sun. So sun. You could do the sun outside. That is fantastic, Simon. So, Simon, I wonder if when we finish today, if you went outside with your papers and you put your hand up, what do you think you would see out there? Would you see shadows or shadow? no shadow with the sun? You would see shadows? Would they look the same? Or would they look different, do you think? Different. Why do you think they would look different? Because there's different things. Right. Around. Like, there's cactuses that have different shadows on your screen. Ooh, so throughout the day, like if you went in the morning and you traced around your cactus and then you went at noontime and you traced around the cactus and then you traced around the cactus again. Oh, that that looks like an interesting thing that you're doing there with your little clip. <laughs> what do you think it would be different or the same? The shadow around the cactus. What do you think we'd notice if we did that? If we did that with using the sun instead of our flashlight. It would be different. Why? Because on a video in the past, in first in first grade, when we weren't at school, I on science there was like this video. And like, so you see this picture, you see this shadow on this paper, right? Right. I'm going to trace it. Right. And now if we just wait a while until lunch, the shadow will move to a different place. Will the shadow move? It will be out of, it will be breaking out of the line. Oh, so it will be a different shape is what I'm hearing you say. Just like your shadow in the morning, those fingers were super long. And then at noontime, they were kind of small. Ooh, Simon, I've got one more thing for you. You ready? 
You ready, Simon? What? Ooh, looking at the sun. I think because I saw you looking at the sun, I wonder if you could make your own sundial. Are you ready? I just thought of this this morning. Okay, so let me uh, spotlight. You heard of a sundial? Okay. Yes, I have. You have? Me yes. too. So what if I made a sundial and I use the shadows and I put a paper plate and I take a straw and then the sun, I could see that shadow. Oh my gosh, it's like your hand. Have you made one too, Simon? I'm raising my hand. You Okay, thank you for raising your hand. So, Miss Sherry, there are so many ways that we can um, look at the sun and the shadows and have our children wonder about what's happening. And that's where science begins is with that curiosity. I love watching Simon today, watching like Simon it. and his brain moving and thinking. I'm like, oh my goodness, I love watching kids think. Uh, and he was, I, I want to challenge you to think more, Simon. I wonder what would happen if you went out and got a big ball, what you would see. I wonder what would happen if you took a sundial outside. Does the shadow move? Does the sun move? I wonder, I'm not sure. I would have to know I, I would have to look and while I'm looking I can be taking notes or drawing pictures of what has happened and then I can come back in the house and I can talk with my adults about what's happening and what I think and why it might be happening and then Miss Sherry we could go back to a book like the one you shared with us and that book we could maybe get some of our questions answered yes so what do you notice and what do you wonder out there in, uh, in Zoom land? What do you wonder and what do you notice? Does anybody have any noticings and wonderings? And does it change with the object that you use? Because we saw Simon using his hand and then we saw Miss Sherry using a sundial. And then what would happen if you went outside and just, oh, I wonder if that happens with your house. I wonder if in the morning you see one set of shadows and then as it goes through the day, do you see different shadows? And then I wonder, does that happen with the moon? Do you see shadows with moonlight? And does it happen with really little tiny things? I wonder, I don't know. That's what science, scientists do. They ask tons of questions while they're working. So boys and girls that are with us today, I, I have a challenge for you. And that is to find as many shadows as you can and try to wonder about how they're happening. Notice what's there and then try to ask questions about why it's happening the way it is. And you know what, Miss Brooke? Not only noticing and wondering like in a day, what if you noticed and wondered for a week or a month or a whole year long, all year long? Oh. What if I went out on... June 1st, July 1st, August 1st, like the first day of every month and looked at the shadows. I wonder if they would be the same or different. See, that's what science scientists do. Simon, what do you want to share with us? Our time is just about up. So if the sun wasn't existed, then like we would be super cold and... And so, and some of us wouldn't know the time. Some people use shadows to know the time. Exactly. I could tell you've been even studying on, about sundials. Even on sundials, they don't use that to tell the time. Right. They use like shadows in the desert, mm -hmm. not sundials. Awesome. Alrighty, I think we're at the point, if I'm correct, with time where we need to find out if any of the boys and girls out there that are watching have any questions for us. Simon, thank you so much for being an amazing scientist with us today. I loved your thinking. I love that you showed boys and girls how to think too. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is look around, notice, 
That means see things. You're going to look around, see things just like you did, Simon. I, what I loved was you noticed you only had three fingers when the, when the light was up above. So there's lots and lots of fun things to see and notice and wonder about. Any questions from out there? I can't see any hands or. <laughs> I don't see any questions currently, but I was just going to say that, Simon, it was such a pleasure to have you as our young scientist today. And thank you, Danny, for being the awesome science, science assistant. <laughs> Um, because like Brooke said earlier, sometimes when we're when we're doing certain things, maybe we need a grown up to help us. But as we ask those big questions and we need to use certain materials and we also need to ask somebody to help. So I'm so glad that you were with us today, Simon. You did an awesome job. And I, I love that you're wondering. I love that you're thinking. And that's what that the whole mission what? of SARSEF is. SARSEF is here to help students ask those questions and wonder bigger and broader. So you were an awesome young scientist today. Thank you. I and asked, I, go ahead. I asked that question because we were like talking about the sun and like shadows. Perfect. So that was a, a connected question. It was connected to what we were talking about. So awesome. Danny, thank you for sharing science oh, with us today. And Brooke and Sherry, you know, as always, we love partnering with SARSEF whenever we can. So thank you, thank you for doing the important work that you do. And, and we look forward to another event with you guys in the future. Sounds great, we can't wait. We'll talk Thanks soon. Fun. Have fun the rest of the day. Thank you. Ah. All right, so next we have our um, second presentation, and this is from one of our near and dear um, university clubs, the University of Arizona Physics Club. So we have four students, the semester is over, they could have ducked out, but what did they do? They stayed on to make this presentation. The content and the videos were all developed by these four committed students to um, delivering physics outreach to our community. So we have Sean Bennett, Peter and Zach from the University of Arizona Physics Club. And like I said, they are committed to uh, doing uh, physics outreach in our Tucson community. So we are so happy to have them here with us. And now I'm going to send it over. I believe um, Sean is our first. Um, so I will uh, send it over to you guys. Hello everyone, may be having a wonderful International Day of Light and welcome to the University of Arizona's very own physics club and our presentation for you today on two different types of rainbows. And before I get into all the science, I want to introduce us really quick. My name is Sean, Bennett, Peter, and Zach will be presenting after me. And I want to note how cool it is that despite everything, we're able to do this in a virtual setting. I'm sitting here at the beach right now recording for you and you'll be able to see this tomorrow. Zach is recording his as well, and Peter and Bennett will be there on the Zoom call, ready to answer your questions in the chat. So please interact, please ask any questions. We're gonna be moving a bit fast here, so if anything comes to mind, throw it out there and they will give you wonderful answers. Now, without further ado, let's get into my part of the presentation here on rainbow sand. Now, before I can describe to you exactly what rainbow sand is, we need to talk about something, and that is called refraction. Let me see here. That is called refraction. So refraction is this really interesting phenomenon that occurs with light as it transfers from one medium to another medium. So as light enters something like glass or water, a medium, air, one of these mediums is a form of space. As light's traveling through that space, it can reach the boundary between that and another space. And at that boundary, refraction occurs and the light bends. So notice here, this is a good visual of it. The light is coming towards this prism, a triangle. It enters. Something happens within this prism, and as it exits, notice the curve, these bending, the bending of light, which is what refraction is. We see a fully formed rainbow come out of the prism at a different angle. Now let's talk about how this relates to rainbow sand, and this is the sand in question. It really does look like sand, especially if you notice on my hand here, on my fingertip, it looks like I've just pressed my finger down on the beach. 
But in reality, this isn't sand at all. It is actually very, very small glass spheres. And they're incredibly well man manufactured. These are smaller than grains of sand and they are almost perfect spheres. As you can see here, I got some pictures with the microscope and these small, small spheres are, are nearly perfect. Nearly perfect, it's incredible. And what this allows me to do is when I have a whole bunch of them, shout out to Larry Hoffman at the U of A for giving me these glass spheres and all the materials I needed to build this demo. When I have all this put together, I can take a whiteboard, spray paint it black, pour these beads over it, and they'll stick to that paint. And then what happens is I have my very own refraction board and you can do this too. These bees are not too hard to procure and the effect is really rewarding. So if this loads properly here, I can show you kind of what we can do with our refraction board. So hopefully this will, this will load up pretty quickly here, but we're dealing with refraction again here. So each of these small glass beads, right? Lights coming in from the sun, bouncing off of them and coming back to my eye. And that creates the effect of the rainbow that we're seeing here. So now, if I take us to this next picture, I can show you some pictures I've taken for you where you're able to see a fully circular rainbow. You might have caught it a little bit in that last video, but these rainbows are fully circular. Why is that? It has to do with these small glass spheres we're talking about. Refraction is occurring here. The light is hitting the small glass sphere, and this is white light, which means it's composed of all these different wavelengths of light. And wavelengths of light, whether you know it or not, it doesn't matter, has to do with when we're talking about light as a wave, kind of how far apart its peaks and troughs are, the squiggles, right? How close together that squiggle is or how spread it out it is. And closer squiggles have what we call a higher frequency. It's a higher vibration. And that gives them more energy, less of a wavelength. And this puts them closer in the visual scale to purple. Wavelengths that are longer with a lower frequency, a lower vibration are closer to red. And so what happens with refraction is it's very dependent on the frequency, the vibration of these wavelengths of this light. So as white light enters the small glass sphere that I have, I have all these small glass spheres I have um, glued to the board, it refracts and all these different colors are kind of split up. The white light splits into these, all the different colors that we can see. And then something interesting happens within these raindrops. This is simulating moisture in the air, I wanted to note. These aren't just with the glass spheres. This is also kind of a slice of the sky per se, especially here at the ocean where there's so much moisture, water molecules in the air. It's almost just like I've taken a piece out that I can show you, show you how rainbows work up close. As you can see, it has something called internal reflection where it bounces off the inside and comes back out. And you can see it refracts again as it exits the sphere. And that creates kind of the spread of the rainbow that we see. You might've been noticing as well, this 42 degree angle. And this is really important. Rainbows are perceived by your eyes only. So as the light hits the droplet, has refraction inside, internal reflection, and then refracts again as it's exiting, it creates this very cool spread of the rainbow. And this happens over the entire sky. And the effect of that is a fully circular rainbow. But because the sky is so, so far away from you, it's very, very large. And this I can demonstrate with this really good video here. I can show you that as you change your position, the rainbow itself changes. We're looking now through the perspective of my phone. What I'm about to show you is how when I move my phone differently, different things happen to the rainbow. Notice as I get closer to the board, the rainbow is smaller and farther away, the rainbow gets bigger. This is what's happening to you. No matter how much you chase after that rainbow, you're not gonna get close to the sky, it's too far up. But maybe if you're in an airplane or something similar, you're, you will be able to witness this effect. So circular rainbows, a really, really cool thing. All rainbows form in this way, or at least all rainbows formed through refraction form in this way. And they're a really cool phenomenon of physics. Refraction's a really cool phenomenon of light. And if you're ever in an airplane, make sure to look out the windows because you might just catch a circular rainbow. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation today. And I know you will enjoy the ones to come. Have a wonderful rest of the International Day of Light. Hello, everybody. How is it going today? Um, that was a video from Sean, one of the fellow, fellow officers here at the University of Arizona Physics Club. I am Peter, the one he introduced in the video. And I've got something a little bit different for you than just what he was talking about. But you'll see a, a beautiful connection as we start to get into it. So I'm going to flip my camera around. And this is a pretty simple demonstration that you can set up at home if you want to. If you can just have a Tupperware container, and fill it up with water. I can give you a sec to fill it up with water in a minute. 
And I'm using a big plastic tote because it's a little easier to see across the camera, but you can use as big or small of an object of an object of a container as you want and just fill it up with water. And then we can start messing around. So I'll be down here, hello. And, and I'm just gonna be messing around with it. So the first thing we wanna know is about waves. So waves are pretty easy to visualize in water, right? You can just shove it side to side. You can go ahead and mess around with it. You can poke it and you get nice, nice waves that go, that move side to side. And an important thing that you're gonna wanna know is the wavelength. So like, well, exactly like Sean was talking about, the wavelength of any wave you make is gonna be the distance between the peak of the wave and the bottom of the, in the next peak. So usually you'll have waves that go kind of side to side and you'll see different peaks like out in the ocean. And the distance between those is what we call the wavelength. That'll be really important to know in a little bit. But first, let's talk about what we wanna do with a fun thing called diffraction. Not refraction like Sean was talking to you about, but this is something that you can also see a lot. And as you'll see, as you'll see in a few minutes, is also very important in how rainbows form. So how, how are we gonna start this? So just take, it, take the water that you filled up and we can just start sloshing it back and forth. Get a nice little wave going. It's what we in, what we in the physicist business like to call a plane wave because it's just got this one plane that's just going back and forth. It's just a straight line. And you really wanna get this because that'll make it a lot easier to see what's about to happen. So I'm gonna use this cutting board and set it in here. You can just use your hand if you want. It's a lot of fun. You can just play along. And if you just wanna splash around, that's also pretty fun too. You can also splash your hand a bunch to make, uh, to make a nice little plane wave as it keeps going. If you have a big enough container that is. But I'm just gonna do this and I'm gonna set this right in here and you're gonna see something really cool happen with this water wave. So I want you to watch the edges of the water. So if you notice, you can see how the water kind of spins around the edge of it. I'm gonna do it again, just so you can see it more easily. But if you notice how the, how the water just goes from being in, in a nice straight line, there's not a lot of other stuff going on. Then the moment I put this in, it goes crazy and gets all bending and wild. And this is a phenomenon that's called diffraction. And what's super cool about diffraction is it's gonna be when a wave goes through this little gap or any gap, and it, instead of just stopping like you would think it does, we actually see it bend away and spread out. And that happens with all kinds of waves but it's easiest to see with the water here. And this is something you can do right at home. Super easy, easy to figure out. Hey, can you even do it yourself like I'm doing? Um, but what's gonna be important to keep in mind is how this is moving and what this diffraction is. Because soon we're gonna see that this has a lot more impact because it happens with all waves. So, what I'm, so now I'm gonna ask you, you folks in the audience, what other kind of waves can you think of? Do you have any ideas? You can uh, raise your hand and unmute. And I just want to know what, what do you think, what, where, what other kinds of waves do you think would have, an, have something like this happen? Peter, what about sound waves? Ah, yes, sound waves are a great example because a good way to, and this is something that's super easy to tell because sound waves are exactly like the waves in this water. They're a kind of what we call, what we call mechanical waves that, because they're pushed. They're like what I'm doing with, by moving my, moving my container around, they're pushed along. And a way you can tell the fraction, you can tell it right at home. All I need you to do is to go in, I'm gonna switch my camera around so you can see my face. So I'm just gonna go in. All you need to do is separate yourself, get a door and then go around the corner. And you'll all have seen this before. You can hear the person talking. Like if my mom was over there in the living room and I talked and even when the door is open, she can hear me around the corner. And that's a great example of diffraction because what actually happens is the sound waves that you send out bounce and bend around the side of the door. So then people behind it can hear you. It's a really, really cool phenomenon. And it's a good way to visualize diffraction where you can't actually always see it. Anybody got any other waves that they can think of? We got 
got a hand raised in the audience. Um, there are electrical rays, there are radiation waves, there are rays that are coming from the sun, like mm -hmm. UV basic. There are, uh, go ahead. Sorry. There are light waves. Ah, there exactly. That's a that's an amazing revelation. Because it's something we we all kind of think of. In fact, Sean was just kind of talking about it. But that was an amazing revelation back around the time of Isaac Newton. And to talk a little more about light and diffraction, we're actually going to go to our third member of the team, Bennett. So well, I'll toss it over to Bennett here. Hello. So uh, now that we've established that light is a wave, uh, my partner Peter has uh, put a lot of effort into establishing uh, one specific characteristic of waves. And that is, can anyone remember one thing about waves that Peter said was very important? It's okay, there, there are a lot of things here. Um, so what's important about waves is their wavelength. Now, if you think about light, what is an important property of light? What is something about light that is different? If you were to try to separate one kind of light from another, what's something about light? And this isn't a fancy physics thing. You guys all know the answer to this one. You can uh, raise your hand. Light can be separated into different colors because light is just one color that's compact of different colors that makes one white beam that the under that the human eye can understand. Excellent. You even you even stole a bit of my thunder there. Uh, but yes, uh, color is something that's different. So if we know that light is a wave and we know that wavelengths can make waves act differently, then we know that what changes with the wavelength of light is color. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, if you have a CD, let me hold this up to the camera. Right now, you don't really see anything. It's just a CD. Why is this crazy man ranting about a CD? Well, if you shine a light on a CD, this is just a iPhone light, this is just white, you will all of a sudden see all sorts of rainbows forming on the CD. Now, why does that happen? It happens because it happens because uh, It happens because if you zoom into a CD at very, very small scales at the back of the CD, this is what you will see. And what's happening is what Peter showed you with uh, waves of water, the exact same thing is happening with light waves when they hit the back of a CD. They're hitting these tiny little grooves and it is making them get all messed up and weird. And that changes their wavelength so that originally all of the light is, you know, in a bunch of different wavelengths, but they're not split up. But once it hits these grooves and then it bounces back at us, the grooves diffract the light so that it's in a bunch of different wavelengths. So it's in a bunch of different colors. So we see a rainbow. And the fact that the back of a CD is all of these tiny grooves. This is why your parents tell you not to touch the back of a CD, because if you even get a little bit of dirt in there, 
it'll cover up the grooves, which means that you can't read them anymore. So now that we have established that, I am sure that some of you are thinking that this is cool, but um, how is this important besides just seeing rainbows on a CD? Well, that is what I will direct, uh, uh, that question I will direct to our final panelist, Zach. Hey everybody, I'm Zach. I want to thank Sean for talking about rainbow sand and how there are so many uses. One of them being you can put the rainbow sand in sidewalks and you can see rainbow glow. I want to thank Bennett for talking about diffraction and how these little gratings on CDs allow for rainbows to show up there. And then Peter for talking about diffraction in other forms, such as what you can see in water and waves. There's one more thing I want to talk about with refraction first. So when Sean was talking about refraction, he was talking about the sun being behind you to cause rainbows. But there's this thing called sun dogs where you're actually looking towards the sun to see rainbows. If you're in the right weather, which is a colder time, it actually happens in Tucson. If you're in colder weather where there's ice in the sky and you look around the sun, you can see these halos with rainbows along the edge. And this one is really big one. You can see a second halo around it with more rainbows. There's also a few things I want to talk about with diffraction. The first one being diffraction spikes. If you take a picture at night, you might see these little spikes on all the lights at night. And that's caused from your camera actually diffracting the light that you're taking a picture of. It also shows up in astronomy where you're taking pictures of stars and you see diffraction spikes around the stars. Now, it makes for a great photo, but it's not always the best thing to have diffraction in astronomy. But there is one time where diffraction is used really well, and that's for this big thing called spectroscopy. In spectroscopy, you're once again taking a picture, and once it hits your camera, you allow for diffraction again. But this time, the diffraction gets, you're able to get information from the diffraction. We use it in taking pictures of exoplanets. If you allow light to go through the atmosphere of this exoplanet, you can actually know exactly what makes up the, the exoplanet atmosphere. And we can know what type of planet it is. There are a ton of cool uses of diffraction. I know the rest of Physics Club is happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you guys so much, Sean, Peter, Bennett, and Zach. I, I truly appreciate the fact that you guys took the time to present, to create your presentations, to create your videos and be a part of the International Day of Light. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I'm sure you could be doing other things and you chose to be here, so I really appreciate it. And um, I'm going to actually wrap up. We, um, we didn't have any questions. And I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up with our, our thanking our sponsors. But again, I really wanna thank SARSEF for being here today for the University of Arizona Physics Club. You guys made this event really awesome for families and we, we really appreciate and value your partnership. So thank you, thank you. So now I'm going to um, uh, thank our presenting sponsors. So Flandro Science Center Planetarium, obviously we're here, we're hosting it and we're happy to do so. Um, and that's with Shiloh Fontes on the back end doing all of the Zoom mastery. So thank you, thank you, Shiloh. Um, Optics Valley, um, a part of the Arizona Techno Technology Council, as well as SPIE, the International Society of Optics and Photonics. And th so those are our presenting sponsors. And then we also have our gold sponsors that you heard at the, the front of this, but um, the University of Arizona Bio5 Institute, as well as Edmund Optics, Leonardo, PI, Physics Instrumente, or PI, and um, Viave. 
So thank you, thank you. This is such a great opportunity for us to collaborate across our Southern Arizona community, but also a bigger, broader reach to the International Day of Light community. So from here, I'm going to hand it back to Zach, our MC. And, um, and like it was said in the chat earlier, this will be, this is recorded. So um, if you wanted to do any of these activities at home with your kiddos, um, the, the supplies will be there as well as um, being able to, to rewatch the um, presentations. So thank you, Zach, I'm gonna throw it back to you. All right, thank you. And yeah, fantastic, fantastic presentations. I just wanna also check in with Shiloh real quick and the organizing team uh, and make sure that I'm not skipping over a break uh, because that would not make me a fan favorite. Uh, do we have a quick break or are we ready to, to keep going right into it? I've got one quick video and then we'll throw it back to you. All right. Welcome to Arizona's Optics Valley. Optics and photonics are the science, engineering, and application of light used everywhere, every day. Arizona is home to world-class institutions and companies in optics, photonics, and astronomy. The industry has a $4 billion economic impact in Arizona. Optics Valley is the industry association that helps companies thrive through business acceleration, workforce development, and startup support, and connects Arizona companies to local and worldwide opportunities. The Optics Valley ecosystem supports strategic initiatives for innovation, growth, workforce development, and networking. Learn more about Optics Valley, where optics, photonics, and astronomy connect and grow.